What's up guys, I'm Dave Klein, and welcome to my spoiler-filled Elden Ring lore series. Today we'll discuss a prodigy who would become a queen and a school influenced by the stars. Today, we discuss Renala, Queen of the Full Moon, and the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. It all began with those who would look up at the stars above. Astrologers, who preceded the sorcerers, established themselves in mountaintops that nearly touched the sky, and considered the fire giants their neighbors. We can find remnants of the astrologers looking out at the stars all over the lands between, via crescent bowl-shaped monuments or, perhaps, moon dials set up on mountains and cliffsides that collect starlight shards. While I'm not certain of the exact purpose of these, one is found on an altar in the royal moon-gazing grounds of Caria Manor, indicating that it was incredibly important to astrologers. Considering they do look so similar to sundials, it could be that these served a similar purpose but for the moon. As starlight shards are regularly found in these, perhaps they were used for that very purpose. Looking at the Preceptor's big hat, we can find markings at the bottom that are movements of the stars drawn on the inside of the brim, indicating the general importance of etching out the night sky. His hat also further tells us that glintstone sorcerers are the descendants of astrologers, a fact that the Karians remain aware of, even if their fate has been long severed from the stars. Oddly, from the Astrologer set, Astrologers would read fate in the stars and are said to be heirs of the Glintstone Sorcerers, but alas, the nice guy no longer cradles fate. Indicates the Astrologers came after the Glintstone Sorcerers, but given the other descriptions, I think it could be referring to modern day Astrologers, as the sky isn't cradling fate, fate has already arrived via the Outer Gods. As the Astrologers were studying the stars, they seemed to accidentally discover sorcery through founding rain. The eldest primeval sorcery said they've been discovered by an ancient astrologer, thought to be the founding glintstone sorcery. The glimpse of the primeval current that the astrologers saw became real, and the stars' amber rained down on this land. At some point, the study of stars became concrete, as various astrologers learned to harness the powers of the stars into sorceries. In particular, Master Azur and Master Lusat. Azur, who was focused on studying comets, and Lusat, who studied meteors. Ah, then you have seen Master Azur. Master Azur was a founding glimstone sorcerer, and my first teacher. A stern judge of men, Master Lusat is another founding glimstone sorcerer. And thus, Master Lusat, along with Master Azor, would also help contribute to the founding of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria and Liurnia, becoming Grandmasters of the Academy. You've seen that structure to the north, towering over the water. That's the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, where we study glintstone sorceries. The school seemed to be founded by masters, such as Azor and Lusat, as well as sorcerers from both Caria and Celia. We can see this by looking at the Academy of Rhea Lucaria Crest, and for this I want to thank Quaylog, as it was thanks to her digging into the various sigils that helps make this apparent. The Academy of Rhea Lucaria Crest has elements reminiscent of both Caria and Celia sigils, with the top more akin to Caria and the bottom somewhat resembling Celia. Mind you, I'm fairly positive at this point, Caria was just a town or family of sorcerers, similar to how Celia is a town of sorcery and not yet royal. When students entered the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, they would first learn the most basic of spells and sorceries, those based around Glintstone. They were given a Rhea Lucarian robe upon entering, robe worn by Rhea Lucaria's magic scholars. Those who dedicate themselves to the study of glintstones formed from starry amber received this modest yet elegant deep blue garb along with their vows of virtue and austerity. But with extended life, one is apt to forget old vows. First, they will learn glintstone pebble. The most basic glintstone sorcery of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, this is a universal first step on the journey to true knowledge of sorcery, and eventually they will learn more powerful sorceries, such as Great Glintstone Shard, before either moving on to a conspectus or washing out. Those unworthy of the stone crown typically end their brief journey into sorcery here. If a student should succeed in their studies, more advanced schools of thought would open up to them, based around their master's very own ideologies. Students who studied and mastered these ideologies would wear crowns depicting the faces of the masters who began the schools of thought in order to help them internalize the teachings and perform better. Of these teachings, there was the Carolos Conspectus. 
The Carlos Conspectus is the oldest of the Academy's lineages of study begat by the Sorcerer Azur. Scholars who follow in his footsteps pursue the mysteries of comets. This is reflected in the teachings of the Conspectus. Spells like Comet, the greatest of the Carlos Conspectus' sorceries that only a very few sorcerers have ever mastered, and the less powerful Glintstone Comet Shard were a part of his Conspectus. There's also Shard Spiral, which was the product of a failed attempt to create a new comet. There was the Livinus Conspectus. The lineage of the Livinus Conspectus began with the sorcerer Lucette, and its adherents continue his study of meteors. Thus, Star Shower and Glintstone Stars were taught in this Conspectus, with Glintstone Stars attracting sorcerers from Celia, Town of Sorcery. Eventually, with the coming of Renala, a new school, the Lazuli Conspectus. Scholars of the Lazuli Conspectus study Karian sorceries, a heterodox pursuit that views the moon as equal to the stars. There was also the Haima Conspectus. Scholars of the Haima Conspectus sought the power to quell conflict and to this end studied the sorceries of Cannon Fire and the Gavel. Haima was the adjudicator of the Academy, and his sorcery employed might as a means to quell conflict. Finally, the Twin Sage Conspectus, who didn't focus on a specific area of study, but multiple. Scholars of the Twin Sage Conspectus were the elites of the Academy, permitted to study and excel in sorceries of all kinds. Those who study the Twin Sage Conspectus are the Academy's elite, capable of mastering the Glintstone Comet Shard and Crystal Burst sorceries. Other Glintstone crowns were bequeathed to students who excelled as well, with them not necessarily being tied to specific teaching. For example, it seems some female students who excelled were given a Witch's Glintstone crown. This gentle-looking crown was granted to a scholar who excelled in her studies, which also merited the title of Witch. Interestingly, as I've been tying these to famous sorcerers whose pictures we can see lining the walls of Rhea Lucaria, I think this glintstone crown is actually supposed to represent Sorceress Selen. You can see me standing underneath her painting here with her glintstone crown. How do I know this is probably Selen? Well, that's actually thanks to a video from Zuli the Witch. Zuli posted a video unmasking every NPC, and in it, we can see this is what Selen's face looks like. Look familiar? It suggests Selen was the first to get this distinction. Finally, there is the Hieratus Glintstone Crown, which I could be mispronouncing by the way, which was granted to scholars who engaged in nomadic study away from the Academy. There is also the Crystal Conjure and the study of Crystallians. Crystal Burst, for example, is a sorcery of the Crystal Cadre, a group of sorcerers who pursued the wisdom of stone, the secrets locked in the faint cognition of the Crystallians. Not much is known about the Crystallians, or at least I don't know too much about them. So if you have theories or thoughts, let me know in the comments. What we do know is that the Crystallians would seem to be an alien race. Shattering Crystal is a sorcery of the mysterious Crystallians. The Crystallians are inorganic beings, yet they live. They cleave close to the ideals of the primeval current, and as such, they are revered guests of the sorcerers. Magic Downpour tells us that it was a sorcery of the Carian royal family, said to have been taught by the Crystallians to mark the swearing of the Old Concord. So, between these, I have to imagine that the sorcerers and Crystallians agreed to live in harmony and help each other. The sorcerers revered and studied the Crystallians with the Crystal Cadre, in particular, trying to understand them. The inscrutable Crystallians had but one clear purpose, to safeguard their crystals unto the end. One theory posits that they yearn for the return of their creator, who will carve for them new brethren. So, perhaps the sorcerers, as part of their agreement, tried to help the Crystallians to this end. We can find Crystallians in the Crystal Cave and Rhea Lucaria Crystal Tunnel, where the sorcerers dug for Glintstone and likely worked alongside these Crystallian. After all, a crystal staff is a staff fashioned from pure crystal, a deed impossible for a human. The Crystallian's faint cognition is known as the Wisdom of Stone. This staff can only be wielded by those of intellect high enough to grasp such wisdom. In order to better facilitate understanding amongst the students, Terra Magica was cast on the Academy grounds. Terra Magica draws an Academy sigil upon the ground, raising the magic strength of those within. Once, the sigil would be cast from the highest belfry of the Academy, covering the entire institution's grounds. This spell allows such vivid experience of spellcasting success, it turns many a fledgling into a true sorcerer in a flash of newfound understanding. The Academy was even around long enough to begin to facilitate its own legends. Lacrima, the long-tailed cat, features in the fables of Rhea Lucaria, in which she is described as a fairy cat who is fond of playing in the Great Bell Tower. Once the school was founded, nobles from around the lands between would send their children to study at the Academy. 
After all, this was before the Erd Tree ruled, so it had its own renown, and even during the rule of the Erd Tree, there was a period where the Academy and Capital were united, so it's pretty possible lords within the Capital might send their children here. The Noble Sorcerer Ashes both showcase this, and show that not everyone was talented enough to don a crown. Spirit of a nobleman who once asked to be given a place at Rhea Lucaria to learn Glintstone's sorceries. His talents were insufficient to be worthy of donning the stone crown, however, and he is only capable of using the most rudimentary sorcery. Many of the sorcerers who failed or didn't try hard enough were sent to the Academy's Glintstone Mines. The Academy does not welcome the indolent. It was in these mines, the Crystal Cave located directly beneath the Academy of Rhea Lucaria and the Rhea Lucaria Crystal Tunnel, that the Academy would mine for its many glintstones. We can also see similar mines in Celia, so it's possible the practice of mining for glintstone began before the founding of the Academy. Here, failed sorcerers would use a digger staff to extract glintstone from crystal tunnels. The staff itself is a tool used to mine, and the ferrule is also embedded with glintstone. These miners would use the spells of Shatter Earth and Rock Blaster to help facilitate their mining, which was seen as shameful to anyone still studying in the Academy. Shatter Earth was a stone digger sorcery used by the glintstone miners of the Crystal Tunnel. At the Academy, use of this sorcery was a stigma that marked out failed scholars. The study of glintstone was far-ranging, with the Academy even employing glintstone craftsmen, who figured out ways to utilize smaller glintstone shards. The Glintstone Craftsman's cookbook tells us that it's a record of crafting techniques left by a Glintstone Craftsman who served the Academy. It contains information on faux sorceries, such as they were called. The Academy became such a prominent feature in the lands that the Academy Gate Town was built around it. The Academy of Rhea Lucaria towers over the north, while at its base spreads the town built around it. You wish to know more of Lady Renala? She is queen, head of the Carian royal family, and governor of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, the great and beautiful Full Moon Witch. When Renala was a child, she was a prodigy. While most of the Academy and sorcerers were obsessed with stars, Renala focused her study instead on the moon. While the study of the moon was initially considered lesser than to the stars, Renala made the Academy see the light. The young astrologer gazed at the night sky as she walked. She had always chased the stars every step of her journey. Then, she met the full moon, and in time, the astrologer became a queen. Queen Renala encountered this enchanting moon when she was young, and later, it would bewitch the Academy. In fact, she was so adept at using these sorceries, she would end up becoming the master of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. In her youth, Renala was a prominent champion who charmed the Academy with her lunar magic, becoming its master. She also led the Glintstone Knights and established the House of Caria as royalty. As I mentioned before, Caria wasn't initially considered a royal house, but it was through Renala becoming master of the academy that she was able to establish her dynasty, showing just how incredibly influential she was. She was likely considered one of the most intelligent of any who had come to the academy. She wielded a Carian regal scepter. The glintstone is known as a Carian blue, enhancing full moon sorceries. Only those of the highest intelligence may wield this, the finest of all glintstone staves. At some point after her coming to the Academy, certain reforms seem to be made. For one, we can now see the influence of the moon on the Academy, as a moon crescent pedestal can be found near the debate parlor, and within, a moon is prominently hung above the center of the parlor. Of course, as a master of the Academy, paintings of her likeness can be found throughout. This also could have been when the Lazuli Conspectus was brought to the Academy. These scholars, who sought to master Karian sorcery, instead learned to see the moon as equal to the stars. This robe, in the hue of the full moon, signifies their heresy. Study of the moon was incredibly important to Caria, and probably thanks to Renala. At the top of Caria Manor is the royal moon-gazing grounds. Here we find chairs set up in a circle around a small pool shaped just like the moon. Nearby, an altar with what I believe to be a crescent moon on top for gathering starlight shards. This study of the moon became of the utmost importance to Caria. After Renala became master of Rhea Lucaria, there seemed to be developments in what some of the sorcerers were studying, that being the Graven School and study of the Primeval Current, which Renala specifically banned. The School of Graven Mages was considered a nightmare that would continue to haunt the Academy. The Primeval Current is a forbidden tradition of Glintstone sorcery. Those who cleave to his teachings, the act of collecting sorcerers to fashion them into the seas of stars is but another part of scientific inquiry. Considering the Graven Mages would quite literally attach other sorcerers onto each other to create some sort of a seed, I think you can understand why a headmaster might forbid that realm of study.
In fact, two of the founding members of the Academy, Master Lusat and Azor, were both banished for this exact thing. Master Lusat is another founding Glimstone sorcerer. And like Master Azor, he was banished from the Academy. Now he languishes in prison somewhere. Since the Grand Masters Azor and Lusat were driven from the Academy, no one has achieved their formerly held rank. It was for attempting to restore the primeval current of Glimstone sorcery. The toothless pedantry peddled by the Karian royal family can rot for all I care. I want glinstone sorceries that open our minds, unbound by terrestrial taboos, no matter what we give in return." And of course, Selen tried to do the exact same thing, putting sorcerers into seeds, hence why she was expelled. Selen was well known, the most promising sorceress in the history of the academy. I followed her at school, but there may as well have been an ocean between us. But Selen was expelled from the academy accused of unthinkable treatment of certain sorcerers under the name of the Graven Witch. I still don't believe the accusations. The illustrious Selen would never do such things. Interestingly, I actually think it shows a good level of restraint from Renala. From Software has a tendency to show sorcerers seeking intelligence and losing their minds by going too far, by discovering things we were never meant to know. Big Hat Logan from Dark Souls 1 is a perfect example of this. So, Renala had good reason to ban this practice in the Academy. And by the way, I think it was Renala, as Selen blames the Karian royal family for the fact she was stopped from studying, and when she thinks Renala is gone, she excitedly takes over to study the primeval current. Do you see this? The Queen of Karia is no more. With the bodies of Masters Azure and Lusat returned, the Academy can hone the primeval current, so that we... Fallen children of the stars shall beam with brilliance once again. For one, Selen is destroying other sorcerers in the pursuit of her knowledge, and in the end, even destroys herself. <sighs> My... oh. <laughs> Additionally, both Azor and Lusat ended up going insane from the knowledge that they would come to. From the comet Azor, when Azor glimpsed into the primeval current, he saw darkness. He was left both bewitched and fearful of the abyss, and we find him as a husk of his former self. Similarly, from the Stars of Ruin, when Lusag glimpsed into the primeval current, he beheld the final moments of a great star cluster, and upon seeing it, he too was broken. Again, similar to Dark Souls 1, sometimes you can go too far. After Renala became head of the Academy, she established Karia as royalty, and of course, herself as queen. Renala is queen of the Karian royals who govern the academy, but Renala herself is no demigod. But soon a war would break out, one between Langdell, home of the ever growing Golden Order, and the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, science versus religion. The first Lyurnian War, Radigan's glory burns red as his hair. Merica and the Golden Order sent out Radigan to lead the army against Rhea Lucaria in the first Lyurnian War. While this is somewhat of a contentious point in that some think Merica and Radigan were two different people who eventually merged together, I'm of the mindset that Radigan is and always was Merica, and that they're more so split personalities. While we'll discuss all of that later, for the sake of this video, it's not a crucial point. What is crucial is that it was Renala's Karian knights who were truly able to repel the attack. The enchanted knights anointed by the Lunar Queen were heroes of the highest honors. These knights' swords could serve as catalysts, letting them wield sorcerous battle skills. Despite numbering fewer than 20, this power made them a match for even the champions of golden battle. The Karian knights never waver. They used a combination of weapons and magic, like Glintblade Phalanx to repel the golden army. Glintblade Phalanx was bestowed upon the enchanted Karian knights who combined this art with their swordsmanship to maintain pressure upon their foes, striking in waves of steel and sorcery. Not only that, but Renala and the Karian royals were able to call upon trolls to aid them in battle. Called into service when the queen invoked an oath they swore, the trolls are treated as true knights of Karia and fight arm in arm with their human comrades. The Great Blade Phalanx is one of the sorceries of the Karian royal family used by the enchanted troll knights. They were comrades of the young Renala, bound by oath. Come, oath sworn giant. Renala and the Karian royalty also used trolls to serve as blacksmiths. I am E.G. A blacksmith who once served the Karian royals. 
Meanwhile, it's likely this was when the sorcerers first developed and used marionette and avionette soldiers to fight with them. Marionette soldiers were crafted to serve the sorcerers. For a doll, the only thing that matters is that it does not break. They would attack with spiked spears in melee combat, while marionette archers were each equipped with a pair of bows. On the verge of falling apart, they are ill-disciplined and attack without warning. They also created avian nets to attack from the sky. Spirits of marionette soldiers with avian features that were created to serve a sorcerer. Equipped with long hafted scythes, they also attack from the skies by lobbing fire pots. Can sometimes malfunction when damaged. While the avian nets and marionettes were prone to malfunction, they did, of course, provide more manpower. While I could be mistaken and these could have been developed before or in a future war, we aren't given a specific timeline, so I'm going to place it here. But if you disagree, feel free to let me know why in the comments below. So, between marionettes, avionettes, sorcerers, troll knights, and especially the Carian knights, the Academy of Rhea Lucaria and the Caria royalty were able to successfully repel Radigan and the Golden Order's invasion. While we've heard about the trolls who were treated well by Caria and the marionettes, which were simply animated by sorcerers, before moving on, I do want to bring up a dark side to all of this, that being the Albanorix. It's my current belief, and I could be mistaken, that it was the sorcerers who created the Albanorix by combining a silver tier with sorcery, and after creating the Albanorix, they used them as slaves. According to the Albanoric blood clot, Albanorix are life forms made by human hands. Thus, many believe them to live in pure lives, untouched by the Earth Tree's grace. So, why do I think they were made by sorcerers? Well, the Academy Gate Town just outside of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria is filled to the brim with second generation Albanorix, and just south of this is the village of the Albanorix. So, by proximity alone, they seem to be related to the sorcerers. But beyond that, color is an important factor in Elden Ring, and the wolf riding Albanoric archers were a blue silver male set, which tells us that blue silver is a metal born from the same mother as the archers themselves and provides protection from magic and frost. Blue is most often associated with the Academy of Rhea Lucaria and sorcery. Not always, but heavily so. Cerulean tears, after all, are associated with focus and magic. Meanwhile, silver tears have actually been used by those associated with magic. The larval tear, which is material required by the amber egg cradled by Renala, queen of the full moon to birth people anew, uses the core of a creature mimicry known as a silver tear as much as a substance as it is a living organism. In Celia, town of sorcery, we find a Nox sorceress and priest who use weapons made of silver tears. The Nox flowing sword, for example, is a grim weapon wielded by swordsmen of the Eternal City. The Chatel has a blade as fine as a needle. Forged from the liquid metal of a silver tear, it is thoroughly tempered until hardened. Finally, the blood of the silver tears you can find in the likes of Nakron Eternal City is the same white color as that of the Albanorix. The silver tears disguise as giant iron balls even drop larval tears, and silver tear husks dropped by silver tears look similar to Albanoric blood clots. I also find it interesting that the Albanorix can use spells, which would speak to the idea that sorcerers would have created them. The Albanorix harbor a secret. They cast sorcery with their innate arcaneness. Within Karia Manor, we find Pitya the Karian's servant. Oh, you? I am uh, sorry, your worship. I apologize for any offense given. I am Pidya, servant to the Karian royal family. I am charged with maintaining these ghastly dolls. In exploring Karia Manor, you can also find another Albanaric on the first level. There's also Loretta. Loretta was made a guard for the Karian royalty and given a war sickle originally given for service as a personal guard to Karian royalty. Her silver mirror shield is similar to that of the Albanaric shield and is a shield of radiant silver festooned with amber and carried by Loretta. The shape is said to imitate that of a sacred drop of dew, which inspired the absurd rumor that Loretta herself was an Albanaric. While the Albanaric shield is similarly a tall oval shield made of metal carried by young Albanarics, the ornamentation represents the primordial drop of dew from which they are said to have been created. While it's not stated that Loretta is an Albanoric, and she doesn't bleed white when you hit her after all, it's possible she saw the plight of the Albanorics firsthand, and this is what led to her deciding to do something about it. Loretta, once a royal Karian knight, went on a journey in search of a haven for Albanorics and determined that the Halig Tree was their best chance for eventual salvation. Now, I'm not sure if the Albanorics were created before the eventual merger of the Golden Order and Rhea Lucaria, 
but I do wonder if the Karnian royalty were the ones who created them, and after the merger they were viewed with disgust. The Knights of the Cuckoo do declare, Behold thy defiled blood, unlike any humor that flows in our grand realm. I can't see any sorcerers particularly caring about things like defiled blood until after the Golden Order merger. The Albanarics' most formidable foes were sorcerers after all. Either way, the Albanarics were mocked and looked down upon. A far cry from Godskin, this Albanaric hide mask is the product of malicious mockery. One more thing to add before I move on, according to the Ripple Blade, it's a unique weapon wielded by young Albanarics. The sword is modeled after the ripples that are thought to be the origin of their species. This may or may not help my case that the sorcerers were the ones who created them, so let me know your thoughts either way. I was chatting with Quaylog, who I highly recommend you check out her videos, and she suggested that the ripple could have been the Nox creating the Dark Moon, which in turn created a gravitational ripple and the origin of Silver Tears. Nox and Noxtella is a topic for another day, but until then, again, I highly recommend you check her out. As the old saying goes, if you can't beat him, join him. After failing to take over Caria and the Academy of Rhea Lucaria by force, Radigan would end up marrying Renala, a political alliance that would join the two houses, although if it was truly for love on Radigan's end, or merely an alliance done politically, I personally think is up for debate. Either way, it was celebrated across the land. Lord Radigan was a great champion, possessed of flowing red locks. He came to these lands at the head of a great golden host. When he met Lady Renala in battle, he soon repented his territorial aggressions there, and became husband to the Carian Queen. Adagan once cleansed himself with celestial dew, repented his territorial aggressions, and swore his love to Renala. The Order of the Erdtree and the Fate of the Moon were conjoined, and all the wounds of war forgiven. As the two great houses of the lands between joined together, it was a moment for celebration across the land. The Full Moon Crossbow was created, a one-of-a-kind enchanted crossbow of exquisitely detailed craftsmanship, made to celebrate the matrimonial union and reconciliation between the houses of the Erdtree and Full Moon, Landell, and Rhea Lucaria. The two rings dance when reloading this weapon, reveals true worth when used with holy infused bolts. Gifts were brought from both sides. For Renala, it seems, Radigan brought with him golden tailoring tools and a gold sewing needle. Sewing needle made of gold, one of the tools brought by Radigan when he entered into marriage with Renala, Queen of the Full Moon, and joined the Carian line. This was also probably when Radigan gifted Renala her amber egg, which contained the great rune of the unborn within it. Meanwhile, Renala's family had a dark moon greatsword they gave to Radigan a moon greatsword bestowed by a Karian queen upon her spouse to honor long-standing tradition. While Radigan would later change this into the Golden Order greatsword upon leaving Renala, it's clear that this was originally a Dark Moon greatsword. Greatsword made of light modeled after the Elden Ring itself, forged by King Consort Radigan to proudly symbolize the tenets of the Golden Order. Telltale signs betray that this was once the greatsword bequeathed to him by his first wife, Renala. As the husband of Renala of Caria, the red haired Radigan studied sorcery. He also forced the instructors to wear a mask of confidence, which was a mask with the mouth sewn shut with gold thread. When Radigan married Renala, he ordered the Carian magic preceptors to don these masks to make it clear that all of their matters were to be kept strictly private. What matters these were, I'm honestly not sure. Although it could be that they too knew Radigan's secret that he was, in fact, Merica. Finally, Radigan brought with him a red wolf to watch over the academy, who, either by him or naturally, was trained in the ways of sorcery. It does seem like this union affected Kari in the study of the moon. After all, go to the moon gazing grounds of Karia and you'll see the Erdtree's light still illuminated, which would bleed into seeing the night sky. According to the telescope, it's an astrology tool used by members of the Karian royal family, a stolen part of a larger instrument. During the age of the Erdtree, Karian astrology withered on the vine. The fate once written in the night skies had been fettered by the Golden Order. With Radigan, Renala gave birth to three children. Radan, who would inherit his father's red hair, Rikard, and Lady Rani, who would find her own moon like her mother. However, I'd like to focus on each of those characters individually in their own dedicated lore videos. This is probably around the time that Radon, in particular, would learn his gravitational magic from an alabaster lord. Something I find particularly interesting is that I'm not actually sure if Karia was on friendly terms with the alabaster lords or not. 
We actually find an alabaster lord just outside of Caria Manor in a royal grave ever jail. This particular one has meteorite, which tells us the sorcery originates from the Onyx lords, who had skin of stone and were called lords in reverential fear of their destructive power. So it draws into question the relationship of Caria and these outer beings. While everything seemed well, a major development would change all of that. Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, had his grace removed and was made tarnished, forced to leave the lands between. In Marika's own words, my lord and thy warriors, I divest each of thee of thy grace. With thine eyes dimmed, ye will be driven from the lands between. Ye will wage war in a land afar, where ye will live and die. However, when Godfrey, first Elden Lord, was hounded from the lands between, Radigan left Rinala to return to the Erdtree capital, becoming Queen Marika's second husband and King Consort, taking the title of Second Elden Lord. Sadly, her heart was broken when Lord Radigan left her. While it's unclear as to what Radigan's true feelings were, Rinala was completely heartbroken and lost herself to misery when Radigan left her. We can even see a statue dedicated to Radigan still by her in the Grand Library. In the end, Lady Rinala was left alone, cradling the amber egg Lord Radigan bequeathed her. Now she devotes herself to it through forbidden rite, the grim art of reincarnation. When Rinala, head of both the Academy of Rhea Lucaria and the Karian royal family, lost her husband Radigan, her heart went along with him. The great rune dwells within the amber egg that was Radigan's gift to her. To be honest, I'm not exactly sure who Rinala is constantly reviving, or I think the key word here is reincarnating. To my best guess, this could be a miscarried child or a child she had that was lost at a young age. But to be clear, this is just my personal speculation. What we do know about these scholars is that they're juveniles born by the Amber Egg of Queen Rinala, the head of the Rhea Lucaria Academy. Yet their rebirth is not without imperfections, and thus do they repeat the process, eventually becoming utterly dependent upon it. Rebirth is as sleep to them, and with each awakening, memory fades into oblivion. In order to do so, she uses the Great Rune of the Unborn, which Radigan had gifted her, an Amber Egg clutched by Rinala, Queen of the Full Moon. Great Rune of Unborn Demigods perfects those who have been born anew. Children born anew by Rinala are all frail and short-lived, imperfect beings each and all. In order to be reborn, Rinala needs a larval tear, the core of a creature of mimicry known as a silver tear, as much as a substance as it is a living organism. Material required by the Amber Egg cradled by Rinala, Queen of the Full Moon, to birth people anew, which I already discussed in relation to the Albinorix. With Rinala clearly losing her mind, Thou, is it thy wish to be born anew? To become a sweeting, reborn of my beloved egg? The Academy of Rhea Lucaria discarded her and her ways. And then, those of the Academy realized that Rinala was no champion after all. The Academy rebelled against the royal family of Caria, and Rinala did nothing. When the Academy rebelled against the royals, she was locked away in the Grand Library. Fortunately for Karya, they had been prepared for this very day. From the Karian Night Shield, carried by knights who serve the Karian royal family, excels when facing magic or holy attacks. Just who were these knights preparing to fight? And that seems to be answered in Karian retaliation. This was the Karian royal family's secret means to prepare against the disloyalty of the Academy. The moon and stars would one day go their separate ways. The Academy of Rhea Lucaria, meanwhile, purchased and paid for mercenaries to attack on their behalf, the Cuckoo. It seems they, themselves, didn't want to participate with their own students, outside of specific battle mages from the Haima Conspectus. Whenever war broke out and the Academy sealed its gates, only Haima scholars dared venture outside. Seclusion is no way to foster discovery, it's only a convenient form of escape. They taught the Cuckoo Knights scholars armament and shield, taught to the Knights of the Cuckoo by the Academy as payment for their contract. They brought with them Cuckoo Grey Shields to defend against magic. Metal Grey Shield painted with a peering Cuckoo, carried by the Enchanted Knights sworn to the Academy. Boasting high magic damage negation, this shield is used to hunt down mages. Our enemy 
is none other than Karia itself. Although it seems these mercenaries' intentions were a little more malicious to take over the academy as well. The Cuckoo Knight armor tells us that its left breast is emblazoned with a peering cuckoo whence came their name. Perhaps the bird's shrewd gaze is an expression of their refusal to be mere servants of the Academy. Something important to note about the cuckoo bird is that it actually has a malicious meaning outside of the now infamous and cutesy cuckoo clocks. I'm going to read this definition from Wikipedia that helps explain it. I also want to thank Yuki Desato RS for informing me about this in my Let's Play of Elden Ring, as I think it helps broaden our understanding of what's going on. Some species of cuckoo are brood parasites, laying their eggs in the nests of other species and giving rise to the metaphor cuckoo's egg and cuckoo's egg being a metaphor for brood parasitism, where a parasitic bird deposits its egg into a host's nest, which then incubates and feeds the chick that hatches, even at the expense of its own offspring. While cuckoo can also symbolize very positive things, like unrequited love in Japan, I think here in this case, the cuckoo represents the more malicious definition. Although unrequited love is also fitting with Renala, so it really works both ways. The cuckoo surcoat depicts twin cuckoos peering into a flourishing mass of glintstone. To a glintstone sorcerer, the body is a transient thing. The cuckoo alone knows its insignificance, yet watches over it all the same. The soldiers of Rhea Lucari were also known as the cuckoos. They were given free reign by the academy to wage wars they pleased, and they were infamous for their rapacious ways. So the knights of the cuckoo left to face off against Karia Manor, but here they met resistance and their demise. When the Rhea Lucari Academy turned on the Karians, the Knights of the Cuckoo descended on this tract. After leveling it, they carried on to the manor. The Karians were taken off guard, but their strength had not waned, and they repelled the Knights' onslaught by conjuring an enchanted snare that remains potent to this day. That is why I say, Tarnished, don't go near the manor unless you wish to lie with the corpses of the heedless knights of the Cuckoo. Karia Manor set all types of traps for the Cuckoo, from spells that would attack armies who marched up to the castle, to enchanted hands, potentially thanks to Rykard, who stayed ready at the front of the castle to leap down on those unaware. Magic traps are everywhere within the manor that will spring to life should anyone step up on them, and attack. Meanwhile, the Karian royals also harnessed magical puppets. Ah. Your worship, allow me to be of use. Other than the puppets, there are some very fine things up here in this storeroom. We find puppets in the storeroom with Pitya. These puppets are none other than puppets of Rhea Lucaria's soldiers. We also find summons of these puppets guarding the second level of the manor. In fact, to this day, Karian puppets still exist at the Karia study hall, which is filled with them, and puppets seem to still be fighting against Rhea Lucaria as we find the two factions fighting along the Lyurnia Highway North, alongside destroyed stone marionettes and avionettes. Ah, the puppets. The puppets besiege us. Finally, at the top of their defenses are Lazuli Glintstone Sorcerers, those who study Karian sorceries, and a Karian Night Troll, with it all culminating in a projection of Loretta. While Karia Manor seemed to take heavy losses, they won out. Near Karia Manor we find the resting place of the contemptible cuckoos, lost in the siege of Karia Manor. An interesting item that I want to bring up is the Karian Filigree Crest, which tells us that it's an honor said to have been awarded to Karian Knights who served as direct retainers to the kingdom's princesses. Now there's only one princess, Rani, daughter of Renala. I do wonder who the other kingdom princesses might have been, and if this might have been when they were killed, or something else might have happened. Back at the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, Renala remained undisturbed, with Rani casting a spell to protect her, creating an illusion of Renala at her prime. Upon my name is Rani the Witch. Mother's rich slumber shall not be disturbed by thee. Foul trespasser. Send word far and wide. Of the last queen of Caria, Renala of the Full Moon. And the majesty of the night she conjureth. Meanwhile, on the outside, a war even larger than that of Rhea Lucaria and Caria was about to take place. The Shattering. 
the Academy of Rhea Lucaria decided not to get involved in this war and shut down. Only its doors have been closed for quite some time now. After they declared they wouldn't interfere with the shattering, the Academy cast repelling seals on the East Gate leading to the capital, and the South Gate leading here. As you might have guessed, the seals are still active making entry to the Academy impossible without a glintstone key. On the Academy's gate is a seal depicting the sigil of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, along with what looks like Radigan's crossed hatch symbol, and the same symbol we see on the Wall of Thorns and Landell. And that is the sad state we, as Tarnished, find the Academy and Renala in during the start of Elden Ring. Thank you guys so much for watching this lore video on Renala and the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. This video really ballooned as I started looking to properly look into the Academy, which I felt was important as Renala had such a major influence on it. I hope you enjoyed this, and if you did, make sure to watch my video on Godric the Grafted. The lore in these games is always an open discussion, so if you agree or disagree with my thoughts, feel free to let me know, and make sure to watch other YouTubers' lore videos or check out other theories as you might find one that makes more sense to you. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Peace.